our next speaker is Dr. Draulio Barros de Araujo, and he is a professor of neuroscience brain institute at the Federal University of Rio Grande de do Norte in Brazil. His research is focused on the acute, lasting, and antidepressant effects of ayahuasca. Hello, everyone. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here again. Um, I thank you, The Horizons, for inviting me. I actually have great appreciation for all the work that you guys have been doing um, for these past 12 years, so thank you for having me here. So I'm here to talk about ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a Quechua word that means, or that has been translated to the vine of spirits. Um, Quechua is a language that's spoken by uh, Indians in the Andes and in the high lands of the South America. It represents basically a decoction that's most often produced by mixing two plants. One of these plants, it's called Psychotria viridis, which is rich in dimethyltryptamine. And the other plant is Bunisteriopsis capi, that's rich in beta carbolines. So basically, the most um, uh, frequently prepared um, ayahuasca, batch of ayahuasca, it's made out of decoction, which means that you boil for an, a couple of days, two to three days, these two, uh, the leaves of one plant and the bark of this vine, and you produce this um, brown colored with a very specific uh, characteristic taste. Uh, and ayahuasca is been learned by us from the Indians, and the first contact that uh, um, explorers have made with ayahuasca is reported around the um, eight, 1849 to 1864 expedition of this English botanist called Richard Spruce. And Spruce spent 15 years in this exploration through the Amazon, um, coming all the way to Ecuador and Peru, and going up Brazil and to the region that comprehends Venezuela and um, uh, Colombia. So the first contact that Spruce had with ayahuasca was up in the Rio Huapes, um, down the, the Black River, the Rio Negro, and um, he had contact with Indians that um, were partaking ayahuasca in different um, ceremonies. It's very hard to know exactly when, for how long ayahuasca has been used for, and that's uh, basically because it's very hard to find preserved plant species um, together with other artifacts that suggests the use of ayahuasca. The fact is that when Richard Spruce and others reached the Amazon, they found already very structured tribes um, with a very well-structured society in these tribes with one element, one individual in these tribes called the curandero. The curandero is basically the one that brings the cure or a shaman. And these curanderos, they use different types of plants to bring cure, to treat illness from their population. Although this is the most well-known use of ayahuasca as a medicine, ayahuasca has different use in their cultural settings. Uh, ayahuasca has been used, for instance, to foresee the future. Um, ayahuasca has been used even in wars by, by Indians. So although it's been used by, for different motives, um, it's still the most used of ayahuasca, it, it's as a, a medicine. In the early 20th century, late uh, 19th century, uh, rubber tapper became a big thing in the Amazon region 
and the first rubber tappers to explore the forest became, or had contacts with um, the traditional use of ayahuasca. One of these rubber tappers, it's uh, Mestri Irineu, or Irineu, um, and Mestri Irineu is um, this big guy, six foot five, 250 pounds, son of slaves, born in 1890. And he was one of these rubber tappers who got in contact with ayahuasca back then. In 1930, uh, Mestre Irineu and other two people had the first ceremony of what is today known as the Santo Daimi Church. That was in May 1930. Uh, after that, a number of other religions have been using ayahuasca for in ritual and in different ceremonies. The, mo the three most well-known churches that use ayahuasca are the Santo Daimi Church, the one funded by Mestre Irineu, and um, Unión do Vegetal and Barquinha are the other two churches that use ayahuasca regularly. Just so that you know, these churches, they gather every two weeks uh, and they use ayahuasca as their main sacrament. Uh, it's, it's also not known how many people um, are part of these religions, but just to give you an idea, the UDV, the Union do Vegetal, alone has around 19,000 affiliates. That speaks to uh, how safe ayahuasca is, um, so that speaks to the effects of ayahuasca. Uh, what we know so far um, is that ayahuasca is relatively safe for many standards. So if we consider uh, the changes, the autonomic changes um, that are promoted by ayahuasca, we do have very slight blood pr pressure increase, very slight. It goes from 12 to not 12, 9 to 1410 uh, or 12, 8, 13, 9. So it doesn't increase that much. Heart rate also doesn't change that much. Um, pupil diameter, it increases throughout the acute effects of ayahuasca that usually last for four hours. So once you drink ayahuasca, the effect starts kicking in for in about 20 minutes and it lasts for about four hours. If we go for more subtle effects of ayahuasca, so try to describe what are the, um, um, the particular effects of ayahuasca, one thing that we find is that nausea is very frequent, um, almost always frequent in the ayahuasca experience. Vomiting is less frequent and diarrhea can be felt too, although it's not that frequent. Um, if we move up a little bit and try to think of what are the behavioral effects or, or what do you feel in your mind when you drink ayahuasca, I guess the most um, reasonable way of saying is uh, by saying that the effects of ayahuasca are um, ineffable. So the effect, one effect of ayahuasca and other psychedelics, um, they're very hard to describe. And that in fact is not something we should take for, um, we should take as something that's specific to ayahuasca. Uh, and we can translate that in fact to our everyday life. The reason why most of the things that we speak are not ineffable, it's because we are able to communicate with other people. So if I ask you, what fear is. The only way you're going to tell me what fear is is by transporting the responsibility of saying what fear is to myself. So ineffability is present in our everyday life. What is the, the, the taste of a strawberry? The taste of a strawberry is, is, is just as ineffable as anything else. You're just going to know what the taste of a strawberry is once you eat a strawberry. So uh, the ineffability of ayahuasca just brings the idea that in fact we are going to this place in which everything we perceive, everything we feel, everything we understand, our thoughts, 
they just change. They just gain a new perspective. They just gain this new ineffable uh, perspective. So other ways of translating the experience with ayahuasca has been trying to put the effects into other standards, like drawing, like this beautiful drawing by Clancy Kavner, um, or, or poetry. So these are other ways that we have been finding to translate the more subtle effects of ayahuasca. Um, but how, how do we do science then with ineffable um, constructs? So basically part of doing science with psychedelics is a very boring part of the process of translating a experience. So, most of what you hear people talking about is how do we translate that experience into something that people will understand. So basically, one thing that we do on the science of ayahuasca is bringing that vastness of experience into a limited reality that we spend most of our time in. Back then in 2006, um, we started doing research, neuroimaging research in ayahuasca. And to do this research, we had close contact with one of the churches in Brazil, the Santo Daime Church, just because all the participants from our first set of experiments, they uh, were um, very experienced ayahuasca users in one of the churches. And back then, it became very clear that the effects of ayahuasca might have some therapeutic value. And we were particularly interested in using or in understanding the antidepressant effects of ayahuasca. In order to do so, we programmed a number of experiments and basically part of my talk will be telling you about these experiments that we started back in 2008. The basic idea is to test scientifically the antidepressant effects of ayahuasca. The first thing you need to do is to assess um, how safety it is to use ayahuasca in a different clinical setting that's not a ritual setting. So taking ayahuasca off its most traditional settings and bringing that into a hospital, so how safe that is. How safe it is to give ayahuasca to patients with depression, with very severe depression, patients that have been with uh, depressive symptoms for the past 20, 30 years. So how safe it is to give ayahuasca to these individuals. In other words, we, the first thing we need to do is to test this new set, which is the fact that these patients have depression, and the setting, bringing ayahuasca into, um, into a hospital. The first experiment then that we did, we basically recruited seven patients with what we call treatment-resistant depression. This is a very technical term, but it's very important for ethical issues and for research purpose. So basically, treatment-resistant depression are patients who have not responded to at least two different medications, two different antidepressants from different classes, at least two. So we had patients who had tried three, we had patients who had tried 15, we had patients who had, trial, who had uh, been um, through electroconvulsive therapy. So, um, out of, so we, we exposed these um, seven patients to a single session with ayahuasca in a hospital. And we were first evaluating the, um, the, the, the side effects of ayahuasca, how long, as compared to, um, to healthy individuals. So is their experience very different from the experience that um, healthy individuals have in different settings? And it turned out that it is. It's very similar. So it's, we shouldn't have the idea that a set determines in a linear fashion what your experience is going to be. In other words, uh, I, ayahuasca and these substances, we shouldn't expect that it just, it will potentiate whatever you're feeling. If it was so, we were not using ayahuasca as an antidepressant, right? So, first thing is that um, the experiences were very similar um, to what a healthy individual would feel. 
Having ayahuasca in the hospital was also positive, uh, mostly because all, all of these patients and all of the patients that participated in the three studies that I'm going to present, they all had their first experience with ayahuasca in a hospital. So that was their first experience with ayahuasca. That was actually their first experience with any psychedelic substance. So they were naive to any psychedelic substance. And it turned out that having a first experience in the hospital, it's positive, just because one of the very basic aspect of having a full experience with a psychedelic substance is to trust, just as we heard other people saying. Um, you have to trust, you have to let it go, you have to follow whatever is being presented to you. And that's a very hard task. I mean, that's actually a practice. I doubt that um, someone here can actually do it. It's more of a practice than anything else. It's just a practice. But it turned out that being in a safe place, being in an environment that they felt safe was very positive for the experience. They felt safe uh, and because of that, a lot of them managed to let um, the experience just happen. The way to access um, if they got better or not from their symptoms of depression was by applying what we call clinical scales for depression. So basically, it's a scale, a psychiatry scale, that has to be applied by a clinically trained psychiatrist. And this, these clinical trained psychiatrists, they, um, with this scale, they are capable of evaluating how severe the depression is. So basically, what you have here in this axis is how severe the depression is. So the higher the number, the more severe the depression is. And this is time. So this is out of our seven first patients and basically what I want to um, turn your attention into is this red um, symbol here which is one of the clinical scales for depression called Madras scale. So what you see here, this is 10 minutes before the session. This is 40 minutes into the sessions and so on. This is one day after the session, seven days after the session, 14 and 21 days. For this first study, we were allowed to um, have the patients in the hospital for 21 days without any antidepressant medication. Um, so what we observed preliminarily from these seven patients is that, in fact, the, the symptoms of depression decreases already one day after the session. This is a big issue. Um, this, is, this, is, this is very interesting, just because if we consider uh, that most antidepressants, they take about two weeks in order to the effects to kick in. So that seemed a very interesting and intriguing different thing of the antidepressant effects of ayahuasca, which is that what we were observed were very rapidly. It, it occurred already one day after the session. Um, so with these preliminary results, we decided to increase the number of patients. Um, we increased it for se to 17 patients, so 17 patients with treatment-resistant depression, a single session with ayahuasca in a hospital, and monitored them for 21 days using the clinical scales for depression. Again, uh, in red, what you see is the Madras scale. This is 10 minutes before the session. This is the session, and this is one day, seven days, 14 days, and 21 days. Um, so what we see is that already in the session, we have a significant antidepressant effect. We have a significant reduction of their depressive symptoms. And that reduction lasts for 21 days. So one day after, we still saw um, that it was still significant and it, it, it was kept for 21 days. For all these patients, we also have a, a um, imaging evaluation, so we use what we call SPECT imaging. It's a nuclear uh, medicine technique, and basically what we see is changes in blood flow, which is related to changes in brain activity. 
And what we observed is that eight hours after the session, eight hours after the ayahuasca session, we did have a modulation in three very important structures for mood disorders. The insula, the nucleocumbens, and the subgenual cortex, the subgenual anterior cingulate gyrus. So these three um, regions are very important for mood disorder. For instance, the insula, it's one structure that we know it's very important in translating the body sensations into changing into changes that we feel in our emotions. So the insula, for instance, it's, an, it's a brain area that have been closely related to what we call interoception, which is the way that I feel my body, the way that I feel um, uh, uh, the sensations of my body. And that has been related to emotions in general terms. The main problem with these two first trials that we did is that we did not control for the placebo effect. So they were both what we call open label trials. So basically you give ayahuasca to the patient, the patient knows that uh, he, him or uh, that they're taking ayahuasca, and the psychiatrists know that what you're given is ayahuasca, so you're not controlling for the placebo effect. Before I proceed, I just have to tell you that, um, you know, we tend to talk about the placebo effect as something bad. We talk about the placebo effect as, Jesus, I had a high placebo effect. And you have that idea until you see a placebo effect working, which is, one of the most beautiful things I had the chance to appreciate as a scientist. So, first, placebo effect is beautiful, it's not bad. Second, it's very... It's very important for this whole experience. Um, I just want you to, to stay with one thing in your mind that um, you know, after I saw, after we saw the placebo effect operating, we realized that if we move um, deep in, in fact, we are all placebo machines. When you wake up, why is it that you wake up and do something? It's because you believe in what you're doing, because you have expectations on what you're doing. So in fact, the placebo effect is a lot more essential than science have been treating it as something bad that I'm just gonna be controlling my treatment against. And with depression, that's very significant. Uh, in clinical trials for depression, you expect to have a placebo effect on the order of 40%. So 40% of the patients that come into a clinical trial for depression will respond positively to the placebo. And why is that? Well, most of the patients that participate in clinical trials, they have tried a lot of different things before. Um, and then they have a chance to come to a clinical trial surrounded by very, um, uh, by specialists uh, in a hospital trying this new medicine, um, so that time is gonna work. And I hear that, we did hear that all the time of every patient, when they got into the hospital, they'll say, you know doctor, I, I think this time it will work. I'm feeling it. So it's very clear that's one of the reasons why we have such a high, we expect to have such a high placebo effect in, uh, with, with, with uh, depression. So, it, but anyways, it's, an, it's a very important thing to test, to control for. If you're saying that something is good for depression, just to say, well, this is, this is the placebo plus something. <laughs> or it's a long-lasting placebo, whatever you want to call it. But we want to see how the substance performs in comparison to a placebo. That brings a, um, a very specific challenge to the field of psychedelics, which is how am I going to do a placebo? Um, I mean, how am I going to do to um, make people think that they took ayahuasca, but it was not? <laughs> There's no way I can do it, sure. Um, and in fact, 100% of our patients who had the ayahuasca, thought that they had ayahuasca. 
So what is it that we can do in order to say, well, this is a good placebo. I'm, I'm really trying hard to test this substance against what we call a control. So we have to, to be very keen to um, control for different variables and to implement a placebo in a more robust way. And what, what is it that we did? So basically we designed a placebo that had some effects. So in other words, instead of trying to convince people that took the ayahuasca that that was not ayahuasca, we are trying to convince people that took the placebo that in fact what they have taken is ayahuasca. So in fact what we're doing is boosting the placebo effect, is making really hard for ayahuasca. And basically what we did was um, we developed this uh, placebo, which is a, a brown liquid. Remember that all the, the participants were naive, so they didn't really know what to expect. It was a brown liquid with water, yeast, citric acid, and zinc sulfur with a little bit of caramel colorant. And the thing is that zinc sulfur, depending on the dose, it brings you nausea. So you, you, you feel nausea, um, sometimes you can have, uh, you can vomit, and sometimes you can have diarrhea. And in fact, we had that in the lab. We had people uh, having nausea. Most of our subjects in the placebo group, they, they felt nausea, um, most, most of the, the participants. Um, one of them vomited and one of them had diarrhea. So, in fact, what we tried to do was to have an efficient um, placebo. Set and setting. So what kind of setting do we have in a hospital? So basically, this was a, a big discussion in our group as how we were going to conduct the experiment. Are we going to do a follow-up integration with the participants? Uh, what kind of procedures are we going to do while they are under the influence of ayahuasca? And we, we gathered actually a lot of, inf to, de to design our experiment, we actually looked for help in, with different traditions. So we went after the UDV, um, we talked from, with people from the Bahkinha, we talked from people that had, we, um, so we, we tried to look for um, help from people that have experience um, in using ayahuasca. A big help came from a friend of mine that's a leader of one of the Bahkinha church, and he was really special in um, making a batch of ayahuasca specifically for the experiment with a single batch, with the same plants, same region, single cook. Um, he was the one who told me, well, you, you, this is the amount you should give, although this was a very interesting discussion with him, because um, dose is not something that he's used in his work to do. Um, so dose is not an issue for him. Um, uh, the music, um, so the, the, the music playlist was, came from mostly from the UDV. Um, we decided also not to interfere with their own uh, experience. And I guess that a lot of us in our group understand that um, as for ayahuasca, maybe we can trust how ayahuasca has been used for these many years as a teacher plant. So um, maybe we do have to understand that it bringing an interference just because we think that we are the most smart thing in earth, um, that we can just interfere with that, um, that might not be the case. And that's what we decided to do. So we did not interfere with their own experience. We were open throughout the experience. We had four days of contact with every patient to get a bond with every patient. Um, that was 35 patients. We also did 50 control individuals. So there was 85 people in total that we spent one day with one week with each individual. And during this week, before and after the experience, we were just there. Uh, we were just there open to listen to their stories before, during, after. Whenever they felt they should speak, we were there. But we were not interfering in any ways. 
Um, I, I remember that um, one thing I used to say to our participants is that, um, so it is as if I'm putting you in a bus and the moment you enter the bus and the bus stop, start moving, I lose contact with the bus driver. I'm not going to be able to take you out of the bus, but be sure that once the bus stops, I'm going to be there. Um, so this is your own experience. You have to deal that with uh, whatever experience it is. This is the setting, it's a, a hospital setting. Uh, this is afterwards when we were speaking with our participants um, after five hours after the experience. Um, so we had a number of, as I, as I said, we had a number of conversation with them. Um, this is the results of our trial. Um, so basically what you see here is the same scale. In this trial, we were not allowed to keep the patients in the hospital for more than 21 days, for more than seven days actually, just because half of the patients were being treated with a placebo. So what's the ethic behind keeping someone uh, with a, uh, in, a, in a hospital if you know that you gave him the placebo? So basically the ethic, the IRB allowed us to have the patients for seven days. Um, and basically what you see here in red is the uh, antidepressant effect of ayahuasca and in blue the antidepressant effect of the placebo. So the better way of seeing this is by um, computing what we call response rate and remission rate, which is how many patients have reduced their symptoms in 50%. That's what we call response. Remission is how many patients have remitted after the session. Um, so, the two things I want to point out, the first one is the placebo effect. So at some point we had a placebo effect of 63%, uh, we had a placebo effect of 44% and then that reduced to um, 27% while ayahuasca was too high and 60%. So as I was saying, we did have a significant and high placebo effect, but it seemed not to last too long. Seven days after the session, the antidepressant effects of ayahuasca were still there, but not the antidepressant effects of the placebo session. Uh, this result is not published, but it's just to have an idea of what happened afterwards. Um, after seven days, basically, um, this is when they started taking another antidepressant medication. Um, so you do see that um, the effects, they are kind of there, although these results are all have a lot of interference from another antidepressant medication that they are taking. Um, so where does it come from? Where do the effects come from? Uh, we could think of molecules, we could think that the different molecules that are present in ayahuasca is part of the reason why we are having this antidepressant effect. So one way to test that, I'm just going to bring two examples of two studies that um, we performed and, and Jordi has performed recently with what we call stem cells. What are stem cells? So stem cells are um, cells that form the bases that can be um, mutated into different cells. We developed a strategy that we can, from stem cells, we can make them go into different cells as we wish. What was, um, where do we find then stem cells? Uh, one of the, in, in humans and in mammals, you don't find a lot of stem cells in our brain. There are only two regions in our hippocampus that actually have a prediction of stem cells. And that's what Jordi did um, with rats. Um, so he, he isolated stem cells from two regions of the hippocampus. And what you see on the left is after you treat these stem cells with a, a control substance. And what you see on right is what happened when you treat with harmine. What you see in green, it's young neurons, and what you see in red is mature neurons, and what you see in blue is just nuclei from cells. So what, what Jordi showed in this study, it's basically that um, the explosion of um, stem cells to harming boosts up the production or 
of, of neurons. So increase neurogenesis. The second thing you could do is, uh, that's very new. It actually rendered the, the, the Nobel Prize in 2012. Um, so basically, the idea here is to produce stem cells from the own person. So basically what you do, you isolate skin or even urine from individuals and you transform these isolated cells into stem cells and then you transform it into different cells. This is a big thing. I mean, you, you're now being able to produce stem cells from, your own in, from the own individual. In other words, it's, it carries all the DNA information from these individuals. Um, so this is what um, uh, we did together with um, Stephen uh, Rehen. I'm gonna talk about him a little bit later. Uh, but basically, it's, these are our stem cells that came from um, the skin of an individual. And basically, what we show here is that the exposure to harmine also increase the proliferation of these stem cells. Um, you could do something even better. Um, very um, um, uh, recently, we have been able to produce what we call cerebral organoids. It sounds like magic, but it's basically the idea that you can, you, from stem cells, you create these 3D structures of neurons that resembles a lot of the properties that we have in our brain. So these organoids are four, millimeter, four millimeters um, in diameter, and they survive for about a year. The only reason why they do not survive longer is because they do not have a blood supply to keep them growing. Uh, but it's, it's, it's what we have been calling mini brain. It's a mini brain with all the genetic information from the donor. Um, and what do you could do with this mini brain? So basically the next study I'm gonna show you that was led by this guy, uh, Stevens Rehan from Rio, uh, basically, what they did was to produce these mini brains and expose these mini brains to 5-MeO DMT. And what's the, 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 the biggest advantage in doing this? You actually have a brain. You don't have isolated cells. You have a brain that's being connected, that these cells are being connected. So it's a lot closer than what we would expect. Um, for a real brain. And basically, what he has shown is that 5-MeO DMT does not uh, have any impact of DNA, so it does not damage the DNA. Second, it does not produce neurogenesis. What does it do then? It affects these cascades of protein changes that, and, and the changes that have been related with 5-MeO-DMT are changes that are expected to help during memory processes, during sleep, uh, and during uh, uh, any kind of neuroplasticity. So we do not have neurogenesis, but we do have neuroplasticity. So what happened then in our brain? Um, the first thing that we found, and that is related to what happened maybe during um, the, the therapeutic effects of ayahuasca. First thing we saw, it's a huge boost in the visual system. Um, so we do have increased activity on our visual system, and that's very important for humans. I mean, we believe in what we see. Um, that's our most important sense, so that might play a very important role for the therapeutic effect as you're seeing things. And as you're seeing things, you tend to believe in what you're seeing, and that's very powerful. The second change that we saw is a change on the DeFOMO network that a lot of you have known and have heard about the DeFOMO network. Basically, the DeFOMO network is a, a set of brain regions that have been related to the process of thinking. Um, so, it has been related to rumination. It has been related to what we call mind wandering. And what is mind wandering? Mind wandering is a process in which we spend a lot of time, actually 50% of our day time, we spend mind wandering, which is you're um, presumably looking at me, but you're not here. <laughs> you are somewhere else, 
thinking about something else. And that's very important for in depression that plays a big role. Rumination, which is a process of spontaneous thinking in which you can't leave those bad thoughts. It's fundamental in depression and it seems to be related to the default mode network. In fact, this is part, um, mind wandering or reducing mind wandering is part of what many traditional techniques have been teaching us, like meditation. What do you do during a meditation practice? It's basically understand your mind wandering, it's basically practice to not be attached to the mind wandering and bring it back. Um, and in fact, this has been observed in ayahuasca. So with ayahuasca, we do observe that um, after a single session with ayahuasca, if you apply, and this was done by Jordi, if you apply different scales that measure mindfulness um, trace, basically what you see is that after a session with ayahuasca, you do have increase in non-judge and non-reacting uh, uh, parts of the scale, which means that you're not judging things any or less as good and bad, and you're not reacting to things as you were reacting before. So, what's ahead? Um, just, in my opinion, I do think that we have a great opportunity. In my opinion, psychology and psychiatry have a big chance ahead a big chance ahead of understanding that humans, we, are not about averages. We are not going to treat any human mental condition robustly if we keep treating us as averages. In fact, if we were averages, we are not going to be here. We are not going to be alive. We are alive because we are about variance. We are about difference, not about averages. So, I have to thank... I have to thank a great number of people. This was certainly the most amazing and the most challenging experience or adventure that I've ever been in. Um, I have to thank particularly this guy, João Paulo, who's, a, um, who's the head of the psychiatry team, uh, and Fernanda Palhano, who was my right and left hand during these two and a half years in which we were giving ayahuasca to people in the hospital. I want to leave you with this image, um, just to give you my final message that the opportunity of science in this field, it's also, it also comes from the possibility of understanding a more traditional knowledge, of going back to the more traditional knowledge and ask for help of how we should, as scientists, how should we proceed. Thank you. Obviously, commonly, depression is unipolar, but there's also things like bipolar and then, you know, mood disorders of various spectrums. Did you get any studies on those types of people? And also, were there responses for the people you studied? Was there any symptoms of mania or of follow-up hallucinations, things like that? Mm -hmm. So, the first question is, unfortunately, um, well, fortunately, science has been keeping itself on a safe side in which most of the, all of these studies tend to exclude patients with um, any kind of mania disorder or psychotic disorder. So that was our case. We also did not have any patients with bipolar disorder or any patient that had a family history of psychotic disorder. Um, the reason why I say that um, it's if, if you go back a little bit in time, you'll see that um, people have tried LSD with schizophrenia and the results are not bad. Um, so at some point, I guess that science has to revisit those 1960 experiments with more than 100 patients and their main issue 
was not the side effect. Their main issue was tolerance. So the second dose was not as effective as the first dose. So the second question is, we, we did not observe any significant increase in many of form symptoms in the group of patients with major depression or in the group of healthy individuals. So we did not see any significant major change in many of form symptoms in these patients. What were people who you said were psychedelically naive, what were they told about what they might experience? What kind of expectations were they brought into the session with? Right. And Great then the, the second part is after it was over and they were in hospital for a three week period, what sorts of follow up uh, therapy sessions do they have during that time? Okay, so the first thing is uh, what we tried to do was to describe every possible effect that they could feel under ayahuasca. But that was followed by uh, the following phrase. You could have ayahuasca and feel nothing, or you can have the placebo and feel something. That's common with ayahuasca users. So you should not expect to have a full effect even if you take ayahuasca, and if you should not expect that you have no effects if you take placebo. Um, as for the follow-up, we did not, as I told you as, as uh, before, we did not have any structured therapeutic setting to follow up with the patients. They were all patients from the clinic in the hospital, so they were coming back regularly, at least in a monthly based, um, to do a follow-up, but it was not a therapeutic, a structured therapeutic session. It was more of a place in which they could just openly say what have changed, what they thought, what they felt, and so on. 